All right. Here we go. Clap three. Oh, clap one. (laughs) (laughs) Clap one on three. One, two, three. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're so glad that you're here. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash. And as always, I am joined by my co-hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How are you feeling? It's not as confident as usual, but I'm fine. I'm doing good. Yeah. Yeah. I'm in the inner rings of a mucus laden hell. I've been taken down. Um, I am, it's not COVID. I'm just, it's just a general illness. Mm. Um, Anybody who listens to the podcast knows I've been burning the candle at all ends. I wouldn't even say both. I'd say both ends and both sides. Somehow you found other ends. Yeah. We threw the candle into a bonfire is the point. And it's, it's burning like the photograph of Sarah Connor in Terminator. We're watching it burn. Um, It's a deep cut. Thank you. Uh, But I'm here and I'm happy to be here. I just want to warn people now. And and I know that this is, I say it as a warning and then people are going to get like, ooh, and rub their hands together. Like I'm on a lot of cold medication. I feel absolutely criminally insane. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mm -hmm. I don't know what's going to come. I never know. We never know what's going to come out of me, but not only am I exhausted, I'm also drugged. So buckle in. Oh yeah. I mean, you never know what you're going to get with us. But yeah. uh, it's a nice uh, warning. True to crime and cocktails top. is like a box of chocolates. <laughs> you never know what you're going to get. And I like that. I like Enjoy that it. about so, us. Now, I have something very serious I need to bring up um, right out the gate. Christy doesn't know um, that I'm, I'm going to bring this up. Uh, I received the timeline. Whenever we do any episode, uh, Christy will create a timeline that has the information that's pertinent on it, uh, helps me as I drive the bus, et cetera. Mm, Sure. And the, the thing that I need to bring up that the serious thing is, is that you've changed your font and I'm shook. I'm going to tell you something. (laughs) I knew there was a story. I knew there was something behind it. It's not my fault. Uh, I, this was probably a week or so ago, a couple of weeks, maybe. I open up a uh, word there, sure. getting ready to start tappity tapping. Yeah. And suddenly I see a thing in my top corner that's like download. It. I mean, it didn't speak, but in my brain, I read it as downloading new fonts. And I was like, what does that mean? I've never seen that before. The default font on Microsoft Word is now different. Oh, it's now a different no. one. And I started Why? typing. The joke is I didn't even notice it was the different one. This is the new default font. And while I was typing, I went, I don't hate it. I don't hate it either. But I'll say this. It is, well, good news. My notes are proper. Um, It's just the timeline that I've sent you. Yeah, now that you've said it. Yeah, that's a good call. Um, Yeah, it's this new, I can't even think of what it's called. Eidos, Aptos, Mm. something like that. It's, It's now just the automatic new default. And I'm like, how do you do that? How do you decide what the next default is? Like I was living my Calibri life or whatever I was doing. Yes. That's what you and I both, we've shared that as our preferred font for years. And I'll say this, if I saw it in time, new times, new Roman, it wouldn't bump me as hard because also, by the way, we as a society have all accepted that it's times new Roman or Arial. Those are the two, I think that are, there's just the most, the go-to's. Times New Roman, we've been dealing with for what, 25 years now, maybe more? Oh, sure. Now they're just choosing a new default? Get oh. out of here. Go take a nap. Yeah. You want to go to the country and buy some jams. Thank you so much for that deep cut. Thank you. Um, if you want to bring in a new font, fine. Sure. Great. I love that for you. Um, but don't force it to be the the automatic because this is like half when the they... time I'm not paying attention. This is like when they put that U2 album on all of our phones without us asking. This is 100% that. It's exactly that all over again. And I know what people are thinking, is a font that big a deal? It is. To us, it is. Well, I mean, when I... (laughs) I feel like I have no leg to stand on because I didn't notice it on the (laughs) timeline until you pointed it out. When you pointed out, yes, uh, it is. I did panic in that moment thinking, oh, shit, did I print my notes off in it? Because it's a wider font. 
It so is. it's the same amount of words, but it takes up way more space. So you feel like it's a longer episode than it is. And then it's a whole thing. Right. Um, but no, my thing is fine. Um, I do my Calibri and I have to, I type it out. And every once in a while, I just randomly bold a specific section. Right. Because it's just easier for my eyes to read. And I know there's that ADHD font where it's, it bolds the first few letters of every word. And I tried that font and I just couldn't handle it. This is just how it keeps my eye moving as I bold specific parts of Calibri. Um, yeah, I hadn't even uh, considered it. But yes, I forgot to tell you, they randomly changed. This is hell. And they didn't just add it. It's, it's the fact that they chose to make it the default. Well, here's the thing oh. that I'm hearing. Now I need to live in fear because there's going to be a day that I open up this computer and it's updated. And guess what? Then the default font is going to make the ends of all the lowercase L's little flippy doos. They've got tails on them. Are we nine? Is that how we're living our lives? Microsoft Word, get out of here. Grow up. I could not possibly be more in love with you than I am right now. I also love, could not be older that I'm like, where's one of those flippy dudes? <laughs> I'm like <laughs> trying on. to look at it, but my eyes are, oh yeah. It's almost yeah, the yeah, yeah. same. It looks like a backwards J because the J, the little tail is very short. Sure. I don't know anymore. I Honestly. Just, <laughs> to me, it's just, it looks like someone re is like zooming in to look at it. Yeah. even though it's the same size. Um, but yeah, I understand what you're saying. And that yeah. was great because I completely forgot to uh, tell you. It was the day that it happened that I went, what's going on? And I explained to my husband while I was typing that it's this new thing. And I just, what the hell? And I was really upset about it. And I went, Lauren is not going to like this. And it's like, it's just because we're set in our ways. Yeah. Leave us alone. I mean, it's like the other day I saw an ad that iPhones are going to come out with like foldable iPhones. And I went, get the fuck out. If you want to go do something, go cure a disease. Use your skills for that. iPhones hit its peak. We don't need <laughs> fold. I'm not going to trust the you know screen what? folds. Absolutely. You're right. Let's take these minds, the smartest, yeah. most gifted minds on the planet, and let's yes. get them on something like leukemia. Can we do that? Can we get him on something like cancer? Yeah. Is that possible? Yeah. There's got to be a change over here. We don't need a, fo a foldable yeah. iPhone. Also, it's the fact that it's all come back around. Oh, it's yeah. all come back around. We all yeah. just got used to the fact that, that this screen is going to turn on sometimes. It's going to turn on sometimes in your pocket or in your purse when you touch it. That's just what we've all become accustomed to. Yeah. No buttons. Now we're going back yep. to the flip phone. Get out of here. I know. And what kills me, though, is, I mean, I think back to my Motorola Razor. Oh, I loved the Razor. Right? Um, and when I think of that, I'm like, okay, did I like the snap of it closing while I, I don't know why I'm doing crab hands, but like the snap of it closing while I'm like, you make a call, snap it shut. And then you're like, business lady, here I go. I was absolutely not business lady uh, when I had a Motorola razor. I also love that. I have to say the full name. I can't just say a razor. I also realize I misspoke. I don't think I ever had the Motorola razor. I think I had the crazer. Amazing. Excuse me. Continue. Couldn't be happier. Um, It's just iPhone wants to like, like the screen is still as big and the screen just folds in the middle. And I was like, that's not going to work. And I know that a phone has come out with that, but so many people have been like, it doesn't work and shown like that it breaks in the middle and that, yes, those screens aren't meant to fold as many times as we're going to fold them, especially because you're now giving them to a generation who's never had a Motorola razor in real life and they've used one just as like a plaything. So now they're like, oh, that's fun to snap it shut like a compact. No, it's not for play. The Motorola razor was built for play. <laughs> <laughs> You're the dead fact, right. The fact that I didn't write um, ads for them is insane. Uh, I also had the one, what was it? The sidekick or something where you can push the the keyboard you out from the bottom up. yeah yeah 
that I like that one. That and like going back to like the old Nokia brick. Those were indestructible. They still iPhones work. catch on fire. Yeah, iPhones, iPhones will like blow up in your pocket. Yeah. Also, maybe let's save that. Let's solve that problem. If we're forcing these beautiful, beautiful minds to work on phones, yeah, let's make them uh, make the battery last longer. And I know people could and say make them not catch on fire. Yeah, people could say like, oh, it's different because it's like you know tech instead of biology or whatever. I don't subscribe. I don't subscribe to that. Mm -hmm. you, one of these people, one of the people who's able to turn an iPhone into a flip, into a flip, flippy do. That person has the capability and the mind power to do other science things. Yes, they could be top. Wrong. They could be top better than I could. I mean, I'd be it, lost in half a second. They may not be at equal level. It could be like when Michael Jordan tried to play baseball. He still was at a high level. Was he, he still a, tried? Did he get it? it well, and by the way, better than most. You know what I'm saying? This is hey. what I'm saying is that I do think it applies. I, I can't it, play basketball or baseball, and he played both. There you go. Exactly. And he was an actor. I, Are we going into that? I was in Space Jam. <laughs> sure, he played himself. <laughs> Yeah. But he had to interact with cartoons, and that can't be easy to make eye contact with a tennis ball on a stick. <laughs> Listen, it's part of what we do. But the point <laughs> is, um, yeah, I I'm really glad that we got into this. And I also just have to say, R.I.P. Blackberry, because I love my Blackberry sitting on a bed of rice. I loved my Blackberry. I loved feeling the buttons click so much. Oh, sure. But I it was never, a nightmare to try Blackberry. and get on the internet. A nightmare. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think I did. Yeah. I mean, I started with the classic Nokia. And then I Snake. think I went to the Razor. And then I think, oh, there I did. There I went without Motorola. Uh, and then I think I did that sidekicky thing. And then I think I went to my first iPhone. And I never looked back. Yeah. I held out on the iPhone for a long time. And now I'll say it. I'm passionate about the product. I couldn't be more passionate. I just don't want it to fold in half in the middle. Oh, yeah. If they're going to do that, at least give the option where you can get a non-foldable They have to. Because it's too to. late. It's too late. I'm not interested. Yeah. I don't need things to fold anymore. No. I'm good. Yeah. I don't know when I ever really needed things to fold. Um. Yeah, I don't have an answer for... When I was chomping at the bit for foldables. But now is not the time. If there now was ever a time, time, it was in my reckless youth. <laughs> <laughs> Again, the Motorola Razor built to play. Yeah, oh I don't. My God. Again, I don't know why I loved that phone as much as I did. Again, I think it was because as soon as you make a call, you snap that bit shut and you, it's the same energy snapping that phone shut regardless as to what the phone call was it's the same energy level as shania twain saying let's go girls like i yeah. could kick a door in i'm ready to go you know like i'm yeah you snap it shut and you're like oh, and i'm feeling all right you know what i mean should we maybe get you one just for therapeutic <laughs> reasons like for you to role play moments well, or something I, the joke is uh I think I sold it to my father-in-law at one point where I was like ready to move on. But I feel like that was definitely the one. And he was like way, way further back uh, technology wise. So it was like a real excitement for him. I think I could be wrong, but. Uh, Fun fact about I, me. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I regret getting rid of all my old cell phones. I was what just I wouldn't, to say, what I wouldn't give to hold that Nokia in my hand. I have all my old cell phones. Good for you. Yeah. I don't know that. I, I feel like I have to also have the old chargers somewhere too. But I, I even my iPhones, I don't trade them in. And I know people are going to come for me and say carbon footprint or whatever. Here's the deal. Sure. I have an anxiety disorder. Okay. And it cripples me at times. Uh, and I Oh, become... they just heard your five minute rant about a font. <laughs> You're right. You're right. Um, it's twofold, though. For me, it's sure. what if I lose this new phone oh, and then sure. I need a backup? And then Reasonable. also, 
are we ever fully wiped off those old phones? Oh, you really? never know. Really? Too paranoid. Sure. And for well, what? They're going to see, what, 25,000 pictures of, like, pets? You know, like, what What am I really worried about them finding? Sure. There's nothing crazy on there. I'll say this. Um, as <laughs> I love you, as you know, I'm a keeper. I, I'm a collector. Once something comes in this home, it's probably not going to leave. Um, <laughs> and uh, I, so I love that I'm fully going to throw my husband under the bus, but he's a real tech guy, you know? Mm -hmm. So he's like, a, he wants like, he wants, he's going to want it cutting edge. He's going to want it new. He's going to want the latest stuff. So the amount of times he's upgraded my phone and I've gone, oh, a new one? Okay. And I was fine with like eight phones back. You know what I mean? Um, cause I take very good care of them because they don't fold anyhow. The point. <laughs> yeah. That we found my sticking point for the day. Um, but the point is, I think he was the reason where it was like, as soon as I get a new phone, it's either you trade it in or I sell it, you know, try and recoup a tiny bit of the money and whatever. Cause he was always like, we don't need them around. And at one point, I think around the time we got married or just before we got married, we had like a bunch of cell phones between the two of us and we did donate them to a program that like gave them to uh, women in not great situations so they could have like a secret cell phone to get out sort of. Oh, that's beautiful. Sort of um, so we did uh, donate a lot of ours to something like that. And then that kind of went away and we couldn't anymore because um, it was a specific kind of phone or something that you had to do. Right. But uh, yeah, I, I would love to, I'd love to hold that Nokia again. I'd love to hear that sharp snap of that, uh, that phone in my face. I, yeah. See, I would, you know what? Maybe the next time I get a phone, I'll just bring my old phone to your husband because I trust him to wipe it. I don't trust me or an employee sure. that I'm meeting that it's a stranger. I'll be honest. Sure. I don't. I don't. Why should I? We've done this podcast long enough. There are oh. so many things that come up in my day-to-day -day life these days. And uh -huh. I'll say something very fearful. And my <laughs> sweet boyfriend will be like, true crime podcast talking. Yeah. And he's always right. Oh, he's 100%. always right. Yeah. A hundred percent. The amount of things, like, I don't know if anyone would believe this, but like four years ago, the hope and joy I had for the world. <laughs> <laughs> and now, now yeah. I see something and I'm immediately like, well, something's wrong there. Yeah. And it, it could be the nicest thing. And you're like, look at that sweet teddy bear. And I would be like, uh-huh. Look at its chokeable parts. Yep. Exactly. Someone soaked it in ether. Like yeah. I would just, <laughs> <laughs> the point yeah. is I'm, I'm now paranoid of everything because we've seen so many different things. That it's like, I yes. never considered that before. And now I'm just always aware. Same. I guess the medical uh, officials would call it hypervigilance. Oh, I like that. I like that. Yeah. I like things that make the negative things you have sound like positives. Yeah, they would still probably categorize it as not being overly positive, but it sounds sure. nice. It does. It sounds like something I'd put on a resume and people would be like, don't do that. <laughs> I can't imagine uh, what it would look like for me to write a resume now. I could not do a job interview, I'll tell you that right now. Because when they pull that mind ninja bullshit on you where you're supposed to like, they ask you for like negative things about yourself, but you're supposed to somehow make them positive. But fuck that. I would just be like, ah, I don't know. Ah, I can't turn off uh, the violent language I have sometimes. Um, for the most part, I'm decent, but I will drop F-bombs regardless as to who's in a room. Uh, and then if there's children, turn around and go, sorry, and then move on with my life. Um, I like to sit down. I don't like being on my feet. But I will work Ooh, myself negative. to death for your company. <laughs> Probably for less pay. Yeah. God damn it, I'm hired. Yeah. You know. I think you just hired yourself. 
I think so. I like yeah. that. It's that quick. <clears throat> well, listen, what you drinking over there? Anything fun? Oh, uh, I uh, did go for a Slurpee this evening, mainly because I have a doctor's appointment very early tomorrow morning. Just a regular appointment. Nothing frightening. Well, I'm not going to like it, but either way. Um, and I'm just worried about having booze seeping out of my pores. Of course. So close to having a a doctor very in my face. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not drinking because I don't want to mix it with cold pills because I, I'm trying to respect my own liver. Good for you. Yeah. I think. Am that's I still great. chugging Diet Coke to try and stay alert? Sure. Sure I am. Um, you need joy. Also, by the way, if anyone hears any rustling, it's the Kleenex. I'm doing my best. I'm trying to take it off mic. There was some sneezing earlier. It is what it is. But guess what? It's cold and flu season, babies. So this is where we're at. Hey, you did great. I was going to, my instinct when I saw you making the motion was to just go, bless you. But I didn't want to give it away for anybody listening as opposed right. to viewing. Right. So I oh, it may not even add pick that up. to the resume. <laughs> Thinks fast on her feet, but only when sitting. <laughs> Thinks fast on her ass. Yeah. Fast on her ass. Yeah. That could be a good title for a memoir. <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah i mean i am still clinging to a dietary misadventure oh but um a classic fast on her ass i don't hate it i don't hate it either put it on the list uh. listen we're discussing of course tall hot blonde what is that well it's a documentary and we're gonna tell you all about it if you're not familiar let me tell you i am so excited about this one i watched this doc some time ago so it's going to be fun to get a refresher because I always oh, forget everything sure. now within five minutes of viewing. Yeah. So to catch you all up, Tall Hot Blonde tells the story of an 18-year-old girl who meets an 18-year-old Marine online. What, start out as, what starts out as friendship quickly escalates to more and soon the couple is embroiled in a passionate online love affair. But when things turn south and the girl starts a relationship with the Marine's colleague, one of the men would end up dead. In a twisted tale full of lies and delusion, this love triangle proves that not everyone on the internet is who they say they are. So, what happened to the people involved? Who was catfishing who? And how did a catfish lead to a murder? Christy Oxborough investigates. The fact that I used embroiled. I loved it. I am, of course, uh, an ep episode beyond this. So I remember nothing. <laughs> this so is always my favorite. When we're, we're both all discovering learning together. it for the first time. Yeah. Well, you'll be happy to know. Calibri. Thank God. Because uh, I was like, this doesn't feel really long. And then when I saw that it was this other font on that paper, I was like, if it's that font, oh God, it'll be even shorter. And then we're fine. <sighs> Anxiety disorder. <laughs> yep. It's fine. Uh, you know how there's so. that folie à deux or whatever it is when two people share a mental illness or whatever it is? Sure. Yeah. It's like the name of the new Joker movie. Oh, uh, sure. We have that, but with anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And look, I'll say it. It's an honor. Yeah. It's, it's nice honor. to feel seen. It is. Folie à deux. I was right. Oh, of course you were. I had no doubt that anything anxiety or... Mental condition wise, that you, I had no doubt that you'd have the answer. Finger on the pulse. And you know what that single finger can do? Snap a phone and toss it in a purse. That was the other thing. You could just toss it in your bag. Yep. And then you, ha you have to like Mary Poppins in there and try and find it again. But you never had to worry about the screen. Never. But if you think I'm not so protective of that phone screen... Oh, I've smashed so many phones. Oh, oh, sure. I've smashed more phones than Gallagher has smashed melons. Let's get into it. They're, they're not getting any better. It's not getting any better. <laughs> I know you might not be enjoying it, but I am. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. I just, all that matters. Uh, and really, in the end, isn't it all just about impressing me? Yes. Not impressing. That's not the word I... Well, it's true. I meant, uh, you know, uh, I was going to say rib tickling. 
but I'm like, <laughs> that might not be the word. See, and now I'm getting inappropriate. And that's where I draw the line for now. Anyway, not on so, my account. So a disclaimer, uh, as we do, uh, this episode will contain brief mentions of suicide and rape. So trigger warning for those who need it. So 46-year-old Thomas Montgomery was a married father of two daughters, aged 12 and 14. He was a model citizen. He taught Sunday school. He was the vice president of the local swim club. And he never had so much as a speeding ticket. In his youth, he spent six years in the Marines. But according to his records, he never saw live combat and was never trained as a sniper. Thomas worked as a machinist at the Dyna Braid factory in Clarence, New York, for 12 years. The company manufactures power tools, um, specifically like smaller hand power tools, I think. Uh, Thomas found the work to be dull. He longed for something more exciting. But since he had a wife and two kids to support, he felt kind of trapped in his job. Because of this, Thomas suffered from depression, as the life he was living didn't live up to the dreams he once had. This caused him to become impotent, uh, which put his 17-year marriage to Cindy in jeopardy. In the spring of 2005, while playing an online on while playing on an online gaming site called Pogo.com, Thomas started chatting with a girl whose screen name was Tall Hot Blonde. At the time, Thomas was going by the name Marine Sniper, a callback to his glory days. The girl private messaged Thomas and told him that he was in the wrong room because that particular chat room was meant for kids. Thomas later claimed he was worried he might get into trouble or that this might be some sort of like to catch a predator sort of situation. So Thomas lied and said he was 18. After chatting privately for a while, the girl re revealed that she was an 18-year-old high school senior named Jessica, or Jessie for short. She was athletic, playing both softball and basketball, and she lived in Oak Hill, West Virginia, with her parents and brother. Thomas, who claimed his name was Tommy, to appear younger, claimed that he hadn't felt love since his mother died of cancer when he was 12, and that he often contemplated taking his own life. Thomas confided that he raped a cheerleader when he was 17, and that he felt so hopeless he enlisted in the Marines. He told her he was heading into boot camp in June to train as a sniper. Quick note, I don't know if that's just something he told her about the cheerleader or if that was accurate. But also, if it wasn't accurate, what were you getting out of that? What's, What's that, that backstory about? What did you think that was going to do? Like. You can't even say, oh, I was saying it to make her want to stay away from me. Just stop talking to her. Say, I'm a 46-year-old man. I'm in the wrong room and leave. Do we even believe he was in the wrong room? No. Oh, well, I, were, I panicked in the moment and, and lied and said I was 18. Really, sir? Oh, no. No, 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 no. I'm just fascinated by... If that was, if the cheerleader thing is a lie, what was he hoping would come out of it? Yeah, that's Was he so sick dark. enough to think that she would be like, oh, bad boy? Like, what was he thinking? But then it's I like, was it true? It's, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating question. Again, like, people typically, like, listen, as someone who's seen every episode of Catfish ever made... Ah. Um, mm -hmm. people typically lie in ways to make themselves seem more, um, like, oh, I don't know what the right, uh, my brain exciting. is swirling, exciting or the opposite where it's like, or, or like, um, at a, at a lower power position. So it's like, I, my, my mother has cancer or, you know, someone I know sure. just died. Like it's odd. It's just odd to, to, to say it, whether it's true or it's false. It's odd. Yeah. It's a, and also, again. by the way, listen, I know we're already going off the rails, but by the way, he's like, well, I was worried it was a catch a predator situation or something. So I said I was 18. Mm -hmm. First of all, we'll catch a predator 
so what? So would you have been saying you were even younger if you were worried that it was that you were about to get trapped? Did you age yourself up than you were pretending to be, first of all? And second of all, uh, if you were worried about something like to catch a predator, are you not worried that you've just told someone that you've sexually assaulted a girl, whether it was true or false? Yeah, a lot of questions. A lot of questions very quickly. A yeah. lot of questions. We, we're still on my first page, and I've just got a lot of questions, Thomas. A lot of questions. Yeah, yeah. So, despite the fact that he hadn't been a Marine for decades, Thomas very clearly never got over it. And honestly, I'm curious as to why he ever left because it seemed like that was the only thing in his life he ever really wanted. Thomas said, quote, I always wanted to be a combat Marine, always wanted to go to war. I don't know, maybe I'm crazy or stupid or something, but I always wanted to test my skill against someone else. Jessie sent Thomas a few photos of herself, mostly shots of her in a bikini, showing that she was, in fact, a tall, hot blonde. Thomas responded by sending Jesse a photo from when he was in the Marines 30 years prior. Did she not notice that the photo looked old? I'll stop interrupting. Uh, the answer <laughs> is, from the best I can tell, no. No, she did not. So Thomas and Jesse messaged each other constantly. They sent gifts. They spoke on the phone. They also often engaged in online sex, during which Thomas would talk about putting his, quote, snake in Jesse's, quote, West Virginia Fox. I'm sorry, but if I had to hear it, so did you. It's horrifying. I've blocked this. Again, I've seen this documentary and I remember none of this. There's clearly well, a reason. Oh, I'll tell you. I found some of this outside the documentary. Okay, now we're talking. Because I found a much more detail than the documentary uh, and some things that I was like, nope. And again, if I find out about them and go, ah, I'm going to force you all to ah with me. That's what we live for. That's, that's what we all live for. That's what, we do. that's what we do. So Thomas later said that the sex made him feel dirty. But it seems like he only ever said that publicly to try and save face because during their relationship... Thomas would message Jesse and say things like, quote, wish you were nude, which doesn't sound like a man with a guilty conscience to me. Jesse made Tommy photo slideshows of herself set to songs like I'm Already There by Lone Star and I Don't Want to Miss a Thing by Aerosmith. Six months into the relationship, they believed they were in love. And sometimes when Jesse couldn't get a hold of Tommy, she would message his father, Tom Sr., who, of course, was also being played by Thomas. So this wasn't a simple catfish. Thomas put a lot of effort into it, including bringing in other characters, such as his father, to try and make Tommy more believable. Now, keep in mind this entire time, this 46, 47-year-old man is openly communicating with a teenager, including having sex online. And as an adult, he should absolutely know how inappropriate and illegal that is, right? Well, according to Thomas, quote, at first, I thought about it. But when it made me feel good, I figured, she's not going to get hurt. She's a young girl. She'll find someone else. Hmm. So as long as you feel good, then it doesn't matter what an absolute creep you are. Got it. Just zero concern for her feelings. When later asked about the relationship, Thomas said, quote, I kept thinking, we're never going to meet. I'll just play the game with her. And while Thomas was being reckless, he was smart enough to know he wouldn't be able to actually meet Jesse. So he had to come up with a reason why they couldn't meet that wouldn't scare her off completely. So Thomas told Jesse that he finished boot camp and he was being shipped out to Iraq. Because that absolutely makes sense. Um, and I know what you're thinking. Uh, I said that they sent each other gifts. 
So how could Jesse send Tommy packages when he wasn't really in Iraq? Well, apparently he told her she could send things to his parents' house. And his father, who of course was also in the military, would just bring it to him when he ships overseas next. Um, but when Jesse learned about Iraq, she did not take the news well. She posted to her online diary. And I quote, My heart was breaking. He told me the only reason he enlisted was to die. I told him to stay alive for me. He asked me to marry him. I said yes. I'll be nervous about my first time. But soon I'll be Jessica Montgomery. Oh. Marriage? Yeah. Uh, apparently Jesse and Thomas were serious, even though Thomas was married and old enough to be her father. But Thomas loved communicating with Jesse because, uh, psychologist hat, she made him feel like a kid again, reminding of him of the time in his life when he was genuinely happy, which was basically him and the Marines. Yeah. Uh, but of course, it was all an illusion. Proof of that can be found in a note that Thomas wrote to himself and kept hidden in his toolbox at work. The note starts, quote, on January 2nd, 2006, Tom Montgomery, 46 years old, ceases to exist and is replaced by an 18-year-old battle-scarred Marine. All paperwork is set, i.e. birth certificate, social security card. He is strong, good-looking, battle-hardened. He has money in the bank, $2.5 and he has a nine-inch penis and is moving to West Virginia to be with the love of his life. Uh, he also added that this new Tom was handsome, like a red-headed Harrison Ford with bullet scars on his left shoulder and right leg. He'd have a black belt in karate and be six foot two inches tall and, quote, the best lover. Oh, boy. And that is what we call compensating for things you believe that you lack. The most telling is that Thomas once said, quote, I would sell my soul to be that Tommy. Yeah. But as much as Thomas lived for the person that he created to be with Jesse, it was causing him incredible stress to hide it from his wife, Cindy. And Thomas, um, that stress was your body's way of saying you were doing something wrong and you knew it. Thomas said at one point he thought he had a heart attack. Turns out massive panic attack from the stress he was having. His doctor recommended Thomas reduce the stress in his life, so Thomas decided to end things with Jesse. But of course, he could not stay away from her. Now, at this point, it has been nearly a year, and Cindy is starting to get suspicious about the amount of time that Thomas is spending online. He said, she started to try and get peeks at his screen. He'd have to hide his private chats. He claimed he was playing blackjack and talking to some friends. As we know, he was absolutely having an affair to the point where he talked about Jesse at work to anyone who would listen. He even said he planned to leave his wife and moved to West Virginia. Then in February 2006... Cindy discovered a package that Jesse had sent to the house addressed to Tommy. Yes, they did actually exchange home addresses, which, to the youngsters listening, is a terrible idea. Yes. But inside the package, Cindy discovered a pair of red girl's underwear. Why had Jesse sent Thomas that underwear? Oh, yeah because he got angry at Jesse and accused her of sending photos to other men, so she sent the underwear as an apology, uh, along with a silver keychain that read, Key to my heart. Oh, boy. Cindy confronted Thomas, who fully admitted to his relationship with Jesse. Cindy accused Thomas of leading Jesse on and said that they should be working on their problems together instead of him talking to a stranger about it. Thomas said, quote, it's easier for me to talk to someone I can't see. 
He said he didn't like being able to see someone's emotions up close in person, which I find a very interesting uh, statement to make. Thomas said that Cindy interfered too soon, and he had planned to kill Tommy off in Iraq to officially end things with Jesse. He even claimed that he had been contemplating taking his own life due to the immense guilt that he felt about lying to Jesse. What about the guilt about lying to your wife? How about that guilt? Apparently we felt nothing about that. Also, yeah. you can't tell me that if he killed off Tommy, that he wouldn't try and move in as Tommy Sr. and then of live his course. life pretending that that was his dead son. Yes. You can't tell me that's not how that would have worked. Oh, absolutely. He's cuckoo bananas if he thinks we aren't on to him, is my point. Yeah, exactly. So, I don't believe for a second that he was ever planning on ending things with ending things with Jesse, especially since he described their relationship as, quote, like a drug that I needed every day. That's intense. Again. Yeah. 18-year-old girl. Not so surprisingly, Cindy said she wanted a divorce, then wrote Thomas a note that said, or sorry, then she wrote a note that she sent to Jesse. Um, oh, no. No, I was right. I love that I've, I'm like, oh, that's incorrect. I've fucked up. No, no. Um, she did write to Thomas. Most people would edit this out. Oh, fuck it. It's fine. So, <laughs> so Cindy writes a note to Thomas that says, quote, I cannot believe you are living out some bizarre fantasy as father and son. If you want to separate, we can. But to continue to lie to me and the kids while she is sending your son gifts in the mail is not acceptable. Cindy then sent Jesse a letter. It read, quote, Enclosed, you will find a picture of my family. Let me introduce you to these people. The man in the center is Tom, my husband. There is no Tommy. He is taking advantage of you. You need to be much more cautious with your safety. You will only be hurt by a man who has mastered the art of manipulation and lies. Do not trust words on a computer. She added, quote, my name is Cindy. As you can see, there is no son, Tommy. I have no son. Tom has no son. He is 46 years old, soon to be 47. He did serve in the Marines, I believe, from 1977 to 1985. And we've been married since 1989. She also asked, are you over the age of 18? In this alone, he could be prosecuted as a child predator. And while I did not read the entire letter, I give props to Cindy she finds out her husband's been cheating and that he's a predator and the life she has known for the last 17 years is over. That is a lot to take at once. And yet she still took the time to try and protect a child from a predator. She told Jesse the truth and tried to warn her to be more careful in the future. Now, Jesse was rightfully pissed and hurt she said she was absolutely disgusted to think she'd been sexting with a 46-year-old dad. Thomas told Jesse he didn't mean for things to go as far as they did. Jesse said she was confused and she didn't know what to believe. So she reached out to a friend that Thomas played poker with on Pogo. His username was Beefcake1572. In reality, he was 22-year-old Buffalo State College student Brian Barrett. Brian worked part-time at Dynabraid with Thomas. Jesse told Brian about how Thomas catfished her, and Brian confirmed that not only was Thomas married, but he was 46 years old and not the 18-year-old Marine that he had claimed. So Jesse was devastated and started to lean on Brian for comfort. They started private messaging on Yahoo, and soon their conversations turned intimate uh-huh angry at thomas for his betrayal jesse convinced brian to post on public forums saying that thomas was a child predator they even got him briefly kicked out of the chat room that he liked uh, jesse then gave brian her passwords so he could log in as her 
and contact Thomas to humiliate him. Brian then showed up at work and bragged about his new girlfriend. Thomas became enraged, but Jesse couldn't quit Thomas. And within a couple of weeks, she started sending him messages about how she missed Tommy and said things like, quote, if he existed, I would still be holding him every night and sharing dreams with him. And, quote, I ache to be with Tommy. Jesse then agreed to stop talking to Brian and said she only started talking to him to get revenge on Thomas. However, Jesse continued to send messages to Brian. Uh, she told him about her part-time job as a lifeguard and how she was getting excited about the prom. As with her conversations with Thomas, theirs would often turn into cyber sex. And hey, no judgment, as long as everybody involved is consenting adults, you do you. Or them, virtually. You know what I mean. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean. So when Brian urged Jesse to go public about their relationship, she agreed to post about him online. I'm assuming like a status update sort of situation. Brian then started bragging at work about how hot his new girlfriend was and how she invited him to West Virginia to meet her. Thomas was furious. He said to Brian, I can't believe you chose her over our friendship. He then told Brian to tell Jesse to leave him alone. Although he said it a little less classy than that, his exact wording was, quote, tell your little whore to stay the fuck out of my life. Yeah. Loves her. And despite Thomas asking to be left alone, albeit in a very aggressive way, Jesse couldn't stay away even after Thomas started threatening her. And when Thomas threatened to cut Jesse out of his life completely, she begged him not to. And that simple choice would end up costing someone their life. Oh my word. What a story. And there's so many twists yet to come. I know. So grab a drink, hit the can, and we're going to be right back with more on the tall, hot, blonde episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Two on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing the tall, hot, blonde doc. Before the break, Christy alluded to somebody's life being cost. What's next? Well, you'll love that I say this now, even though by this point... <laughs> It will have been too late. But I know the dear people like to watch um, documentaries that we're about to talk about. I know they like to watch them in advance. And I hesitated about posting this one. I did to let them know. I don't know how easy it is to find now, but because it is slightly older. But I really hope some people didn't. I think we have a real mix. I think some people do like to, but I think other sure. people, they don't. Yeah, Because I just feel like if you know the full thing going in, it's not as exciting until you get hit with certain things and you're like, oh, shit. Yeah. Then it 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 takes it a different way. But I mean, if you have seen it, you get uh, you get the chucklehead experience. So exactly. It is what it is. Sharky so. just put his butthole on my Diet Coke can. I just need you to know <laughs> that. This is like I ask for so little in this life. Can I just not Do have your anus, your dirty anus touch the mouth of my can? I'm going to have to throw this out. What You'll love this. We can pause so you can get a fresh no, one. No, no, we don't do that here. We're fine. I'm just going to have a lozenge and some water. Sharky, don't take her joy. Oh. Anyway, I, sh I should have done this on the break. Why am I scratching around with candies? Anyway, well, you love candies. They're for my voice. I'm trying so hard to come up with like a Diet Coke slash like, but make it butt, like diet butt. You know, without it being just bud. Die butt coke? Die butt coke. Yeah. There it is. Disgusting. Yeah. Anyway, uh, you were saying. So, when Jesse first started a relationship with Brian, she would message Thomas about it, and she'd say things like she had stripped for Brian on camera, stuff like that. It was untrue. Um, and clearly something she was just saying to rile Thomas up. And then Jesse changed tactics 
and started saying that she was planning on breaking up with Brian uh, because she couldn't stop thinking about Tommy. Thomas said, quote, I still care for you a little, but I want you devastated. Which is a red flag to absolutely run away from this man. I mean, it wasn't the first red flag, but it's definitely been the brightest one so far. Yeah. Uh, Thomas then went on a downward spiral and started sending Jesse messages that were completely unhinged. Couple of examples for you. He said to Jesse um, that she had, quote, turned his heart ice cold. Uh, he sent one, quote, Brian lost a good friend and he made a very deadly enemy. He then added, quote, I hate him with a passion and for 10 cents, I would eliminate him. Wow. Yeah. Thomas said, quote, I am the ultimate weapon. I am a Marine. He also said, quote, Brian will pay in blood and payback is a motherfucker. Wow. Jesse promised not to speak with Brian again. So Thomas agreed to forgive her, but only if she promised to never lie to him again. I'll remind you that for the first eight months of their relationship, Thomas was the one lying to her. But apparently he didn't see that as a big deal. Thomas then told Jesse, quote, if I find out any lies you told me, you will lose something very close to you. He then threatened to kill her mother. Because wow. he that uh, wow. Jesse and her mother were close. Uh, Jesse's mother then allegedly learned about the relationship and went online and told Thomas to stay away from her daughter. Jesse promised that they could continue to see each other and her mother would never find out. And things were going well until Thomas discovered that Jesse had added Brian to her friends list on MySpace. Thomas was enraged. He started acting out at work, including making threats to coworkers and once tried to hit Brian with his car in the parking lot. Thomas then took out his aggression on Jesse, messaging her constantly, calling her a whore. And then he sent her the horrifying message. And I quote, I don't ever want to meet you or see you unless you are being gang raped. Wow. Again, this is a grown adult interacting with a child. In the summer of 2006, Thomas learned that Jesse and Brian were secretly messaging, messaging each other. He spewed horrific things to her, usually calling her a whore and threatening to physically harm her or someone she loves. But Jesse begged for forgiveness. And yes, the whole back and forth, on again, off again nonsense is irritating for everyone involved. But one of the things I hate the most here is that during their dick measuring contests, where they would both try and lay claim to Jesse, both Brian and Thomas seemed the most interested in who would be the one to take Jesse's virginity. Gross. Horrifying. Virginity is not a Pokemon card. It is not something you collect Taking someone's virginity does not make you a big man. And of course, the whole thing is so much worse when one of these men is a fully grown adult talking about an 18-year-old girl. Yeah. And while Thomas started acting unhinged, the absolute final straw for him was the day when Brian walked into work and bragged that he had officially made plans to go visit Jesse and he planned to, quote, pop her cherry. Gross. Again, it is so gross. Um, this made Thomas absolutely snap. He started obsessively messaging Jesse, increasingly aggressive messages. And for once, Jesse seemed tired of his bullshit and she started ignoring Thomas. Which, thank God. You know what I mean? Yeah. Again, he said to her once, I want you devastated. Yeah. Which is unsettling. So 
At 1.33 a.m. on September 13th, Thomas told Jesse that she was a whore and that was all she'd ever be. She did not respond. He messaged her the next day, asking, quote, Hey, whore, you suck your boyfriend Brian's cock today? Jesus. She continued to ignore him. Then on Friday, September 15th, Thomas called Jesse on the phone, fully screaming at her in what she described as an uncontrollable rage. So Jesse hung up on him. Later that night at 10.16 p.m., Brian clocked out of work and went to his white pickup truck that was parked in the Dynabraid lot. Once he was in the vehicle, someone came up behind the truck and fired three shots through the driver's side window. Two hours later, around midnight, Thomas messaged Jesse asking, quote, you waiting to hear from your boyfriend? When she didn't respond, he messaged her again around 2.15 a.m. and said, quote, come on, your boyfriend Brian won't mind you talking to me. Monday morning, Brian's pickup truck was discovered in the Dynabraid parking lot. Brian's body was slumped over in the front seat. He had been shot once in the upper left arm and twice in the neck. Brian Barrett was described as caring, kind, bright, and always had a smile for everyone. He had an infectious smile and had dreams of becoming a teacher. Brian was just 22 at the time of his death. During the police investigation, Thomas was determined to be a suspect almost immediately, uh, especially since his behavior had become increasingly erratic at work, and he had been bad-mouthing Brian to anyone who would listen. One co-worker even said that two weeks before Brian's murder, Thomas asked him what time Brian usually got off work. Which is, you know, not great in this scenario but when thomas was first questioned about the murder he randomly told detectives he needed to get his lunch out of his car first because otherwise his peaches would spoil <laughs> stop it um stop it his affinity for fruit would be his undoing <laughs> <laughs> a fucking psycho uh oh, that's the greatest thing you've ever written <laughs> a peach pit was found next to brian's truck and it was tested and discovered to be a match to thomas's dna it's just i can't yeah uh, police later found a 30 caliber rifle at thomas's home the same weapon that had been used in the murder Thomas was arrested on November 27th and charged with Brian's murder. Thomas denied any involvement, claiming that he spent the evening at a local restaurant and that he arrived home around 10 p.m. When Thomas's wife, Cindy, was asked, she said he didn't arrive home until 10.30 or later. Mobile phone records also placed Thomas in the area of Dinah Braid at the time of the murder. Also, Thomas found a leather, or police found a leather cartridge case near the crime scene that had dog hair on it. Thomas's family dog, Shadow, um, had uh, very similar colored hair to the hair that was on that bag. And when Thomas first went to jail, during a call to his wife, Cindy mentioned that cartridge, ca cartridge case. She said it was covered in dog hair. And Thomas said, quote, of course it was. Don't you remember how messy my car was? I mean, at this point, bro isn't even trying to hide it. <laughs> Not police, even close. police then discovered hundreds of pages of texts and messages between Thomas and a girl named Jessie. There were also dozens of photos of this girl on his computer. When investigators checked Brian's phone, they learned about his relationship with Jesse, the very same girl whose photos were on Thomas's computer. Police then were instantly concerned for Jesse's safety. A detective called Jesse in the middle of the night to confirm her relationship with both Brian and Thomas. He also warned her that she might be in danger. 
And since Brian had Jesse's address, the detective contacted a local police department in West Virginia and requested that an officer do a wellness check on Jesse. But when the officer arrived at Jesse's house, Jesse wasn't there. Her mother, Mary Sheeler, told police her daughter had gone out and she had no way of contacting her. The longer the officer stayed at the house, the more nervous Mary became, and soon Mary fully confessed. Mary Sheeler, the 45-year-old stay-at-home mother of two, had gone online pretending to be 18-year-old Jesse. So yes, while Thomas was catfishing Jesse, it turns out Jesse was catfishing him. But where did Mary get all the photos she used on her fake profile? From the real 18-year-old Jesse, who happened to be Mary's daughter. Oy, oy, oy. That's right. The mother used her daughter's pictures and real name to interact with men on the internet, which is absolutely shocking for a woman who was described by people as one of the best parents around. Mary was at every softball and basketball game that Jesse ever played in. She volunteered at the school and in her community. Mary claimed that due to boredom and the fact that her husband was often gone to work, she joined the Pogo site, and it wasn't until she paid for a membership on that site she realized that she had been using Jesse's screen name. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Since the account was listed as a teenager, Mary was immediately placed in a room for teens, and for whatever reason, Mary just didn't bother to correct the mistake. Which makes it feel like it was never really a mistake. At exactly. All. Mary said that she had been happily married to her husband, Tim, for 23 years and that she had no intention of starting a relationship with anyone. She claimed that when Brian started flirting with her, she didn't know how to turn him down without revealing who she truly was. It's easy, Mary. Just say, no thanks. Or, if you'd rather, just don't respond to private messages at all. There's listen, I'll get into this at the end, but like, sure, there's so many times along the way. Yeah. Where you can go, mm -hmm. okay, she got in too deep. She, she took it too far. Yeah. But there are so many times where you're like, you didn't bow out then. Ay, ay, ay. A hundred percent. But I like that. It's a similar tale. If I may, uh, may. to Thomas. Where they were both like, oh, I didn't mean to. It just kind of happened. And it's like, no, I actually think you guys were meant to find each other. Yeah. The 40-some-year-olds uh, who longed for the excitement of their youth and liked pretending to be someone else online. Yeah. And the Isn't true, that wild? The true joke is Jesse and Tommy actually would have hit it off. And once, like once you found out that he was a 40-something-year-old man, that was your moment to go, here's the situation. Yep. I am still this person, or I'm actually this person, but yes, if you want, for just online sake, pretend to be those 18-year-olds, which again is so fucking creepy because it was her daughter, but if you want to pretend to be those people online and you both know it, then then where's the harm there, aside from, again, her own daughter? Um, but once he told you, that was your moment. Yes. To be like, oh, <laughs> you won't believe this. <laughs> yeah. But same. Crazy story, but same. Yeah. Or, weirdly enough, meet up and who knows? They have shared interests. They do. Like lying. Oh, yeah, that's a big one. I don't know how you plan a wedding around it, but it's tough. You know, I mean, the best wedding planner will figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Everything will be white. Gorgeous. Little white lies. Anyhow. Yeah, there it is. So um, there is uh, the question of once Mary realized Thomas was lying about his age, why did she continue that relationship? Mary claims she only did so because she believed that if she kept Thomas occupied, then he wouldn't go after a real 18-year-old girl. Okay. 
I think that Mary loved the drama and the attention, and she knew if Thomas discovered that Jesse was a real was really a woman in her forties, he'd lose interest. Yep, real fast. Then she added, she became worried that if she stopped talking to Thomas, that he would harm himself, and then she worried that he'd harm her family. And to that, I want to say, if that's a concern, then don't give your address to strangers on the internet. Sometimes it might work out okay, but sometimes it's not worth the risk. I'm going to say most times. Oh, yeah. 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 Uh, it wasn't until after Thomas's arrest that he learned that Jesse was really a 45-year-old woman. <clears throat> Does that mean the communication that Thomas had with Jesse was actually legal? Sure, it's still horrifying because he truly believed he was talking to an 18-year-old that whole time. But keep in mind, this thing went on for like a year, and they keep saying she was 18, she was 18, she was 18. You can't be 18 for a full year. I mean, yeah. you can be, but she had to have been 17 at some point was my point. And I feel like right. everyone just keeps focusing on, well, she was 18. And it's like, she wasn't always, though. Because she didn't turn 19 while they talked. Right. They talked for at least a year, if not more than a year, I think. Right. The fact that I actually said the lines, you're not 18 for a full year. You are, actually. <laughs> but if only if, again, they would have had to have started talking on her on birthday. On her birthday. Yeah. The odds of it. Um, right. I also feel like he just never thought of it, which is... Uh, you know, a horror show. Yeah. But, uh, but Thomas was shocked to learn that Jesse was a 45 year old woman. And to that, I say, really? You're shocked. You're shocked that a beautiful 18 year old girl wasn't interested in a verbally abusive, toxic man in his late forties. And look, I get that he was so focused on the loving attention he was receiving that he didn't want to stop and consider whether it was genuine or not. But really? I can't. Also, to learn that she was a 45-year-old woman, you didn't know that photo of his was a, was old? Mary. Like, Did she not, though? Like, this is the other question that I have. Oh. Did she not know? Or was she like, this guy's lying and I'm going to dig in deeper? This is delicious. Right? And I'm going to, oh, yeah, she fed off it. She fed has to it. have known. We all know what a 30-year-old photograph looks like. Get real. Oh, I guarantee if you sent a, like a 30-some-year-old photo to like a teenager now, they'd be like, ew, what's that? Why like, is it they, so they'd, grainy? Yeah. They'd catch on pretty quick. Yeah. Although I guess you could probably lie and be like, it's a filter. I also don't know why. <laughs> In this instance, someone trying to relate to teens would talk like that. But but also, why would a Marine yeah. put an old timey filter on a photo of him Great at war? Call. Like that just feels Great insane. Call. It's also the fact that he continued to be like, I'm a machine. And like all these things where it's like, you never saw combat. You never trained as a sniper. Settle down. I want to test my skill against other people. Okay, sit down. Your yeah. skill? Get out. Get out of town. Ah. So, in April 2007, while in custody awaiting trial, Thomas attempted to take his own life after his daughter sent him a letter saying that they were no longer interested in a relationship with him. Mary testified in front of a grand jury, and in August 2007, Thomas Montgomery agreed to take a plea deal, so he pleaded guilty to first-degree manslaughter, he was sentenced to 20 years in prison, followed by five years probation. Thomas filed an appeal, claiming that he was pressured to enter a guilty plea. He was denied. He will be eligible for parole within the next few years. Oh, right. Thomas says that the guilt eats him alive, but he believes Mary should also be doing time. Mary Sheeler was not charged with anything, because there was simply no law against what she did. She did not physically help in Brian's murder, and she didn't outright tell Thomas to kill Brian. Nope. She also 
from what I can tell, never told him not to, but she never told him to do it. And if he brought it up, she never said, yeah, go for it. Like she never did anything like that. So in the end, there was nothing that she did that was technically uh, illegal. What she did was incredibly shitty and absolutely led to Brian's death, but her involvement was not technically a crime. Mary claimed that she confessed the truth to her family, but she didn't. She told them that she was in a chat room where she ended up speaking to a man with mental health problems named Thomas. But when Mary started talking to another man named Brian, Thomas got jealous and killed Brian. She really pushed the idea that she was also a victim in the story and seemed to show absolutely no remorse whatsoever. Her daughter, a.k.a. the real Jessie, got curious and eventually Googled her mother, and that's when she discovered the truth. Can you imagine? No. She knew her mother was somehow involved in some sort of internet love triangle that turned to murder. She had no idea that her mother was pretending to be her on the internet or that she was sharing inappropriate photos of Jesse with random men on the internet. The worst part is that investigators searched Mary's computer and discovered hundreds of pictures of Jesse, most of which were clearly taken without her knowledge. And while that may seem like a reasonable thing for a parent to have, the photos also, um, inc there were also videos, including a uh, particularly compromising video that was taken up Jesse's miniskirt. Disgusting. Uh, Jesse clearly did not realize she was being filmed in that moment. It turns out that Mary emailed that video to several men Ugh. and said, quote, do you like it? Again, this is her own daughter. It I also mean, it should be illegal, in my opinion. Well, that specifically should be, yes. Yeah. A hundred percent. It also turns out that Mary had been sending Jesse's photos to multiple men, not just uh, Thomas and Brian. So, not surprisingly, Jesse has cut all contact with her mother. Mary's son, Tim Jr., says he still speaks to his mother, but she refuses to talk about what happened, and she still has not taken any responsibility for her part in Brian's death. When asked about Brian's death, Mary describes the whole thing as, quote, a giggle that got out of hand. A, a man is dead, woman. A man is dead. An absolutely senseless murder is how you describe getting out of hand. And he was a kid. He yeah. was 22 years old. Jesus. Yeah, it's gross. Um, Her son also added that she spends a worrisome amount of time on the computer. Hmm. Uh, shortly after everything was made public, Mary's husband, Tim, left her. During the divorce proceedings, Mary allegedly approached Jesse and said, quote, why don't you get over this? And if that isn't bad enough, Mary has still, to the best that I can tell, uh, not apologized to her daughter in any way for any of this. Mary now lives with her parents. She said she one day hopes to write a book about the dangers of the internet. No offense, Mary. I don't think you're the right person for that job. Yeah. Brian Barrett's parents have spent the past nearly 20 years trying to create new internet laws so that Mary's actions would one day be a criminal offense should a similar situation ever occur. Yeah. This episode, of course, was named after the documentary and Lifetime movie uh, that was made about this case. I've, I've seen both. And I have some thoughts I'd like to share. Please. I know you've seen the documentary. I don't know if you've seen. I the, don't think I have. The movie. So specifically speaking about the 2009 documentary. Now. 
I know that I've never personally made a true crime documentary, but I've seen a lot of them. And this one was not well made. (laughs) Honestly, what threw me the most was it was narrated by someone who was pretending to be Brian. And so it was all in first person. For example, um, a photo of Brian would come up on the screen and the narrator would go, yeah, that's me. And it's like, no, 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 no. It just did not feel like the right choice of narration. It threw off the entire tone. Uh, But according to the user reviews on IMDb, I am in the minority here because, and this is one of my favorite things, uh, one IMDb user said the documentary was, quote, one of the top 10 OMG moments in cinema history. I don't know that I'd consider a documentary cinema, but okay, fair enough. Uh, That same user also said, quote, the voiceover actors were high caliber. And the film, and it was, quote, the the film was outstanding, and I've pretty much seen them all. So at this point, the user has to be a troll, right? Claiming it was outstanding, yikes. But then to be like, I've seen every movie ever made, it's insane. No, I wonder if it was Thomas or Mary that was reading those comments. It has to be, because not a single person on the planet has ever seen every movie ever made (laughs) (laughs) yeah and then there's a 2012 lifetime movie which was directed by courtney cox (laughs) oh wow the movie stars garrett dillahunt as thomas of course and laura san giacomo as his wife It took a lot of liberties with the story, but that is to be expected uh, with a made-for-TV movie. So I'm not uh, slacking it there. It was shot in just 16 days. Yeah. And it shows. (laughs) (laughs) Ah. Uh, I kid. Uh, But I also don't. Um, I mean, it's a Lifetime movie, so no offense to the brand. You go in with low expectations. As far as lifetime goes, it was fine. Um, I'd like to be clear. I adore Garrett Dillahunt. I think that man is a chameleon. His characters in the TV series Terminator and Raising Hope absolutely prove what a fucking talent that man is. And look, one IMDb user rated the movie... Uh, Most people said either it was mostly enjoyable or excellent. One even said, quote, one of the better Lifetime movies I've ever seen. One review said, and this is maybe my favorite review anyone's left for anything on uh, the internet, quote, not bad for the boob tube. Absolutely cackled the first time I read that I just I have I don't even know what to say uh one other review uh said quote youth is wasted on the young which feels incredibly inappropriate when discussing a movie where the only young person in the film dies yeah great point because great point nobody wasted on the young what they weren't young I mean Bless, I'm trying to think of 40s as young, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Now, before I go, I know that I've repeatedly mentioned the potential dangers of meeting someone from the internet in real life. And I said that people need to be careful um, about who has access to their address. And I fully stand by that because you never know who you are truly talking to. And it goes without saying, But yes, there are times when people meet on the internet and things actually work out. I get that. I spent a large chunk of my early 20s making friends in a Yahoo chat room. I even dated a guy that I met online. It didn't work out, but it also didn't end in murder. My point here is I understand sometimes it works out, 
but I am also in no way giving shade to the internet, bringing people together. I just want people to be careful when it comes to their safety, especially in a case like this, where it's a grown man having a relationship with a teenager, or at least that's what he thought in his mind. According to the Child Crime Prevention and Safety Center, there are an estimated 500,000 online predators active every single day. The mere idea is horrifying. So yes, while good people can be online, not so good people can also be online. So it was just my point of, I know there are going to be people who hear this and are like, what's wrong with meeting people on the internet? Sometimes it works out, but, but sometimes it does not, was my only point. Another case in point. So in 2006, Matthew Pike and his girlfriend of three years, Joanna Witten, were living together in Nottingham, England. They were both big gamers and were especially into a game called Advance Wars. They were so into it that they started a website called Wars Central, which gave other fans info on the game and kind of an online community where they could all interact. David Weiss, an office worker from Germany, was active on the Wars Central forum for about eight hours every day. He used the name Eagle the Lightning. And soon he developed an obsession with Joanna and then he added her as a friend on Facebook. He sent her messages saying he was interested in meeting her in person. Joanna, not interested at all. In June 2008, Joanna and Matthew returned from a vacation to discover David randomly on their doorstep. David claimed Joanna posted her address on Facebook. Joanna denies this. Uh, it was later discovered another member of the forum gave David the address after learning that David had a crush on Joanna. And to that person, I say, bad form. Absolutely form. not. Having a crush on someone does not give you a free pass to their personal information. You also know that she's living with a partner. Yeah. So, you know, maybe don't. So David gets the address from someone else and shows up unannounced. And Joanna and Matthew are justifiably uncomfortable. However, they felt bad for David because he claimed to have no money. He had no hotel reservation. They tried to find him a place to stay. Uh, Joanna called about 25 different hotels looking for a room. There he had no luck. So they begrudgingly allowed David to stay with them. I don't know why. Uh, maybe I don't know the layout of their home. But I, uh, David slept on the floor at the end of their bed. And Joanna said she would often wake in the middle of the night to discover David just standing there, staring at her. During his thankfully brief stay, David repeatedly asked to be alone with Joanna. She refused. He also gave her several love notes, which told her to leave Matthew so they could be together. Joanna made it clear she was not interested, and she was very happy in her relationship with Matthew. After three days, David finally left. However, he ended up spending several weeks living in a hostel so he could be closer to Joanna. Dear God. He started messaging her on Facebook 100 times a day. He begged her to leave Matthew. Uh, David then showed up at their place a second time about a month later. This time, the couple just outright told him to leave. They blocked him on social media. They blocked him on the War Central website. David returned to Germany on July 18th, and Joanna didn't hear from him until early September uh, when David contacted her and threatened to return to Nottingham and stab himself to death in front of her. Joanna and Matthew agreed the next time he shows up, if ever, were contacting the police. Two months go by, not a word. So Joanna and Matthew believe the problem is over. Then September 19th, Joanna returns home from work to discover a pool of blood in her living room. She followed the blood trail to discover Matthew's body. He had been stabbed 
86 times. His official cause of death was blood loss. Matthew was just 20 years old. He was described as modest and easygoing. Before he died, Matthew managed to use his own blood to write the letters D-A-V on the side of his computer. Joanna then told the police about David, who had claimed to be in Germany at the time of the murder. But on September 24th, David was extradited to the UK for questioning, where he admitted to the murder, but said it was self-defense. Oh, boy. You heard me correctly. Self-defense. David claims the knife fell to the floor during a struggle and Matthew stabbed David in the leg. Again, Matthew was stabbed 86 times, which is absolutely not self-defense. Neither is going to a person's home uninvited carrying a knife. David yeah. finally admitted he hid the knife in his waistband, flew from Germany to Birmingham, took a train to Nottingham. He arrived at Joanna and Matthew's home wearing thick gardening gloves. And when Matthew opened the door, David forced his way in. After stabbing Matthew repeatedly, David returned home. He said he was only in the UK for maybe 16 hours total. Prior to Matthew's death, David told a friend, quote, if she rejects me, I don't know what there will be left. I've said it on the show before, and I'm going to say it again for the people in the back. Women are allowed to turn you down. Joanna didn't need to be in a relationship to say no, and she certainly didn't need an excuse to say no. She simply wasn't interested. And that's enough. That's absolutely enough. In May 2009, 22-year-old David Weiss was sentenced to prison with a minimum of 18 years. Reporting for this roller coaster ride of an episode, I'm Christy Oxborough. Fantastic work as always. Wowzer. Oh, so much to talk about, so much to discuss. Let's take one more quick break and we'll be right back to discuss our thoughts on Tall Hot Blonde on this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. Clap on three. One, two, three. Welcome back to this episode of True Crime and Cocktails. We're, of course, discussing Tall Hot Blonde. Oh, where to begin? Where to begin? I just feel like, you know, we talked about it in the beginning, but from the beginning, Thomas is so unhinged. And then you realize when you go back through this, so was Mary. Oh, yeah. It's so unhinged, her behavior. And the fact that she also hasn't apologized, told her daughter to get over it, like, wild. Oh, wild. Yeah. Because when you think about it going in, and you think that, like, the whole thing has one tone when you think he's talking to an 18-year-old girl. Oh, yeah. But then when you add on this second layer, if you go back and think about it all through, it's like, this is just, they really, this is the joke. Well-suited. Well-suited yeah. to one another. Like, oh, they yeah. really seem like they have a lot in common in terms of values and, uh, you know, mental state. Um, You kept saying gifts at the beginning, and I heard gifts, like they were sending each other GIFs on their oh, phone. Oh, sure. And I was like, sure. no, you can't send one of those because you were like, they sent gifts to the house. And I was like, how are you sending a gift? Lauren Ash, wake up. Wake up and put down the Tylenol Severe. You know what I'm saying? You know what? I'm going to print out a GIF and I'm going to mail it to your home <laughs> and then prove to you it can be done. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. Thank you. Um, This list, this letter that he wrote to himself saying that he ceased to be in the 18-year-old version of him, oh, that's chilling. Really chilling. You know? I don't, I don't know what to say about that other than, yeah, really upsetting, chilling, all of the above. Um. Hiding this caused him to have so much stress he thought he had a heart attack. My God. I, I mean, the, the, it's interesting, though, because there's TikToks about this. And I know we aren't getting our news from TikTok, but I did research this because I was, like, very interested. And it is true. I'm going to be simplifying because we don't have enough time. But there is this 
whole kind of thing that's come out about the chemicals that our brains release when courting. And I, of course, am blanking on the name of the, the one chemical, but the chemical that men tend to release is the same chemical that comes out with stress. So, and I think that this is also a factor in for, for women and, and all people, obviously, but the whole kind of idea behind this is, is that in the early stages of a relationship, that chemical gets released. So one could argue that when you get deep into a relationship and you get comfortable and people talk about like, oh, the spark went away or whatever. Sure. It's actually just that you're comfortable with the person. You're not in a constant state of stress, but our brains and bodies interpret that as being a negative when in reality that that's like a, that's a resting state, right? So the fact that he was so stressed about this, that he thought he was having a heart attack, I think at the same time, he felt more alive than ever. I think oh, he was yeah. feeding on these chemicals that his, his body is releasing and staying in this. And to be honest, I think all three of them were. And that's not me speaking ill of the dead at all. He was 22. He was he was a child. Um, it's more that because you think about like, how do people get into these dramatic situations? But the whole point is, is that it's like our bodies are kind of wired to feed on drama. It's a thing. So if that's the case, then it starts to make sense. Now, obviously, this got taken to a way higher level than it should have or or what have you. But sure. I just thought it was easier or, or interesting to, like, think about that, that it's like, wow, you were so stressed that you thought you were having a heart attack. And I guess that means you were releasing a lot of that vasodeferin, I believe it's called. Wow. Be but anyway, fascinating to me. Again, not only the psychology, but also the science. I like that. Yeah. It's the same reason why people can like like um when people have affairs, right? It's like sure. it's not even necessarily about what they're doing. It's about the it's about the deceit. It's about the stress that it's causing. And people aren't logically thinking that. They're sure. not going like, I'm gonna do this to stress myself out. But that's the chemical that gets released when you feel that feeling and it makes you feel alive. Sure. Right? I'm using Alive, colloquially, obviously. Um, the quote, it's easier for me to talk to someone I can't see, speaks to state of mind so deeply. So deeply. This is definitely a person who, yeah, is having a hard time connecting in general, I think. Probably struggles with real connection, authenticity, vulnerability, all of those things. Oh, yeah. Um. We kept talking about a 46 year old and I was like, in, in, in comparison to 18, obviously that's, that's quite a difference. But then I was like, oh, 46. And then I was like, Lauren Ash, you're 41. I'm 41. Yeah. That's only five years away. I'm not saying 46 is old. I was just saying it sounded so like, you oh know, yeah. If I hear something. It sounded so mature. Yes. If I hear something that's like mid to late forties, I'm like, whoo. And then I'm like, God, I'm just a blink away. Yep. It's you don't think about that. A couple of long naps away. Yeah. Until the big need, nap. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it feels. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. <clears throat> There's just so many details I have written down here. Yeah. Here's the next place for me. So it comes out that Thomas is faking. I'm going to call, oh no, I'm going to call her Mary because it was Mary. Mary finds out Thomas was lying. This is all confirmed by yep. Thomas's wife, Cindy, and by Brian. And she can't quit him. And that to me is the first place where I go, okay, Mary, you're a 45-year-old woman who is engaging in this out of control, reckless behavior. That is a moment where you, that is a moment to make you go, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Yeah. And it feels like she did try to just go on to his friend. First of all, why? Like the internet is infinite. Yeah. So why did you have to stay in this story? Like go find someone else in another state or another country. Like why, yep. you know, if it was just about being bored and talking to someone, it's like that falls apart because it's like, no, no, you were, again, you were chasing whatever high or stress chemical or or drama or however you want to label it 
you're chasing something that you were only going to get from staying entangled in the three of them. Oh, a hundred percent. The fact that Brian was bragging at work, this is Ugh. enraging Thomas. The fact that she would, you know, finally kind of start ignoring him, but then his messages became unhinged. I'm the ultimate weapon. Brian will pay in blood. This is the next moment I go, Mary, this is the time to end this. You're yep. dealing with two real life people. And let's all remember, you're also posing as your daughter who exists. Yep. Who has the same name and address. Yep. So you are endangering your own child. 100%. And you have to know you are because this man has literally just threatened the life of another guy you're talking to. Yeah. And then at one point he threatened Jesse's mother because he was like, I know you guys are close. I'll right. take her away from you. And it's like, you right. think that man wouldn't be capable of showing up at your home waiting for her to answer the door and then just shooting her? 100%. Or just waiting outside the house for her to come out or go in or either way. Like, he's already shown you what he's capable of. Yeah. The second he starts losing his mind on the internet or, for example, tells you he wants you to be gang raped, that's the moment you're like, I should be careful because I'm wearing my daughter's face in this. Thank you for that. Yes. No, I agree. That, that was the next point where I'm going... The next point where I'm I'm going, he she needed to cut it off was when it was like, I'm gonna kill your mother. That's when she introduces her mother character into oh, this yeah. and says to leave them alone. First yeah. of all, cut it off, girl, cut it off. Yep. Second, then I don't want to ever meet you or see you unless you're being gang raped. It is your child. He is talking about your child that way. Yeah. He knows what she looks like, what her name is, and where she lives. And she continues to engage. Mm -hmm. That's, again, that's where it loses me, really. Now, granted, if we want to talk about where she really lost me, it was at the very beginning of this where he said, I raped a 17-year-old cheerleader. Or I, when I was 17, I raped a cheerleader. And she continued to use her daughter, her teenage daughter's photo. Yeah. And name. And give him the address. That was at the very beginning. Oh, yeah. That was early. That was early. And that wasn't enough to make her go, red flag, I should move on. Yeah. I guess maybe I shouldn't be surprised that she went through all of this and was still engaging. And the fact that they were arguing over, Thomas and Brian were arguing over who was going to take Jesse's virginity, it's like, I don't understand the psychology of this woman. I remember when I, and it was a while ago I watched this documentary, but I remember feeling like, she just felt her daughter was so beautiful that it was almost sure. like an extension of herself, that it gave her oh. esteem to hear men kind of like lusting over her daughter because she created her daughter, right? Sure. So it was like, it was it was feeding her own ego because it's like, well, she only exists because of me right. and they think she's hot. So that brings me validation, which is right. beyond twisted. This oh, isn't like a yeah. parent being proud of their child. You can also think that your child is beautiful without parading them around on the internet. And and also, as we know later, filming videos of, of her in ways that are so vile. Like, what is this yeah. mother doing? Oh, it's a horror show. Absolute horror show. Absolutely. Um, his affinity for fruit would be his undoing. Probably my favorite sentence you've ever written on this show. <laughs> In almost four years. I think I think I've just I've become unhinged or something, but it was learning that I mean, first of all, I can't imagine telling anybody, let alone a police officer, before we talk, I gotta go get my peaches or they're gonna spoil. I can't imagine. But then when it came out that it was like one like a peach pit was in was found at the scene and it had his dna on it then i was like oh my god and i said out loud to myself i'm like well the peaches were his undoing and i was like oh i like yeah <laughs> i've just gone off the rails mentally and, 
And you know what's interesting for me is that anytime I hear the word peach or peaches, I think of three things at the exact same time. My dog peaches, R.I.P., hit recording artist peaches. I can't even, I don't even feel like I should sing those lyrics on that on the show because they're a little bit racy. And finally, I could eat a peach peach for hours. hours. Yep. Yep. One of our favorite movies. Thank you very much. Yeah. Face. Um, you said it was her mom, Mary, and I wrote down the whole time, the whole time. Yeah. Like Again, that's that. the only, it's the reveal of Mary. That is the only reason I'm like, I hope you didn't watch the doc because it's a, the reveal of like, hold up a second. Cause it's a whole different feeling when you think that's a teenage girl. Oh yeah. And then I you remember find that out they're catfishing each other and they also both pretended to be their own like their own parents yeah this again like, like they're they're diabolical they're cut from the same cloth yeah she also uh uh when news cameras went to interview mary she was like i'll i'll talk to you but you can't show my face because she's terrified that he's gonna get out of prison and go hunt her down well it must be nice mary to want to have your face hidden when you put your daughter's face and other private parts all over the internet. Right. A ton of random strangers to see. Oh yeah. That that feels to me, I'm sorry. That's an that's a entitlement she does not deserve. Oh sorry. It's gross. I can't even imagine what her daughter has gone through since then. I can't imagine what her life is like. I mean, who knows? What how do you even what what's your move? After that, change your name, I guess. Yeah, I think like, you have to. I mean, it's, oh, again, it's the fact that it's your own kid. Yeah. It's doing it to any child is like, even like a random one you find their picture online or whatever, that gross. But your own child is so next level. Oh, it's sick. And you it's can't sick. tell me she stopped. No. Absolutely not. After she's this, she's probably still using her no. photos. She's oh, probably still probably. using the same photos. Probably. But it can't so be as creepy. easy to fake it like it was that many years ago. Right. Because suddenly now it's so much easier to like FaceTime and because you can't like if you have a phone, well, you can't say I don't have a webcam or whatever. But people still do. If you still if you watch Catfish, even to this day, people will still do that and people will still accept it. Isn't that wild? Yes. And that's the thing. Like, that's the thing they'll always say on that show is like, is it not a red flag to you that they're saying they can't FaceTime? But you're eye messaging them. It's always yeah. the same. It's always like, oh, the camera on their phone is broke. It's always the same. Sure. Every time. Or they don't have a data plan or they don't have Wi-Fi. Like there's, it's always the same, but people will still play that and people will still buy it. And the crazy thing <sighs> is I've seen some of those episodes recently where then it ends up that the person is real. And they just were, were embarrassed or, or whatever. There was sure. one episode recently. Oh my God, it was heartbreaking. This guy was using someone else's photos. Um, because he was embarrassed about some things about how he looked. And then she was like, oh yeah, no, I'm, I'm good on that. And it was literally like he had had like some teeth accidentally knocked out. Like it was something that was like also fixable. Like it was something that he was fixing. Um, it was just kind of heartbreak. It was one of the few times I really felt for the catfish. Oh, I was like, he, he was, you know, it was because he was like, well, I was just really self-conscious. And then she basically was like, yeah, you should be. I'm not interested anymore. Which is wild. Yeah. And it wasn't, I, I can't remember the details too. I think it was one of those things where like the photos were were close to him. Like it wasn't that it was like he was pretending to be a completely different person. It was, yeah, it was sad. I mean, listen, oh. I'm I'm riveted by that show. And the fact that there's still so many of those stories. I'm always, I always love the random one they sprinkle in where the person's legit. Oh yeah. Where it's like, oh no, that is them. Yeah. That I've I, I was always drawn to. There's also I've not where seen that show in years, but there's I should... repeat catfishes now where they'll like come upon someone and they're like, you've got to be kidding us. You're doing it again. <sighs> yeah. 
I actually, I, I love the, I, I mean, I don't, I don't like people lying to other people, but the idea of like the look on their faces of like, you, I mean, oh yeah, it's like kind the hands of, on the hips and the, what are you doing? You rascal. Yeah. 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 I also love Mary saying she was bored, but then also she felt if she kept Thomas occupied, then he wouldn't go after a real 18 year old. Again, mm. this like weird martyrdom, this weird, like, well, I was doing a good deed. Like it's unhinged. Oh yeah. She absolutely came up with that at the last minute. Just yes. like, a, I had no idea I was using her screen name until after I paid for it. It's like, get out of town. Yeah. Because Come there's on. no way your daughter's using that screen name. No. Especially also, on that same site. What is Pogo even? Like, I don't even remember that one. Apparently it's some sort of like online gambling. You can do different, like play why blackjack. Is... You can play poker. You can. Then why is there a kid's room? I don't know. <laughs> why are they having a kid's room in a like online casino? That doesn't make any I, sense. I need to believe it's just pretend like just games like it's not oh, okay. actual money is what i need to believe but i don't even know if i buy that but yeah it was specifically a kid's room again she i had no idea i was using my daughter's name it's like why was your daughter's name already listed as a screen name on that website if she didn't already have her own account because if she had her own account you can't have the same exact name so then it's, well, then you no. absolutely typed it in. Right. Because it doesn't even make your sense. daughter would see the messages going back and forth if she actually had already used that name. Right. Oh, this woman does it. Her story doesn't even make sense. No. Um, I wrote down Christy loves Garrett Dillahunt. Uh, <laughs> I do. I and do. Then, Again, chameleon. Absolutely. And then I just, the last thing I have to say is, is that I think this, this story about, um, Matthew Pike and, and Joanna and, and David Weiss. This one chills me because it isn't even online dating. It yeah. wasn't like online dating gone wrong. It was just somebody who happened to develop this obsession with okay. someone from the internet that they hadn't met, then goes out of their way to find them. Like, And to your point that you made earlier, of course, lots of people meet on the internet. I feel like that's like the number one way people get together these days. Sure. Um, that is obviously true. But the other thing I will say is someone who, who online dated for years, there's still always the element of risk. We all know this. Like that is just a fact. You never actually know who you're showing up to meet when you're, when you're meeting up with somebody. And sure. even if someone sounds there's, there's this other um, scam I was hearing people talk about again on TikTok. Again, I Googled to verify it. Now, there is no proof that this is 100% true, but there's lots of accounts of women chatting with guys they meet on an app, on a dating app, mm -hmm. making plans, and it's always the same restaurant, and they always get stood up, and then inevitably end up staying and ordering a meal. So the theory that's going around with all these women is that the, the online dating accounts are being run by this by restaurant. The restaurant. Oh. Now, again, there's no way to actually prove that, but there's enough of them. I don't need to tell you where there's smoke, there's fire. Something's up, whether it's the restaurant doing it or not. Something's up. If this is happening to this many women. Right. Jesus. I mean, yeah. Depressing and a horror show. I'm, I'm also sadly, like, almost impressed. Like, I'll say it. If I show up and he doesn't show up, I'm not. No, I can't say that. I was going to say, I'm not getting a meal. No, I'm getting that meal to go so I can fucking eat it with a bra off at home <laughs> after having gussied up for but a guy who this. didn't show. Think about this too. Let's say it's not the actual managerial staff trying to get sales because that feels like, okay, what? A one, one meal every so often. Are you really making that much money? Sure. It could be some employee that this is just a fun game. Where it's like, any oh. night I'm working, I'm going to play this game and watch what happens. That feels plausible to me. Oh, 100%. I mean, what we've just talked about for the last two hours is is feels like it's along the same lines. Where it's like, again, to quote the Dark Knight, some, some men just want to watch the world burn. 
And by that, he meant people. <clears throat> Gross. It's like a it's like a dude who was turned down and was like, oh, it's like a dude who is on a dating app, gets turned down by specific women, and then creates another account and goes and finds the women who have turned him down and uh, catfish them and so he can sit and watch them. Yeah. Get revenge. Oh. I think that's the most likely explanation. I could see that. I could absolutely see that. All of this is to say, just be safe out there, folks. Look, yes. if you're if you're on the internet talking to anybody, just be safe. Be aware. Always let someone know where you're going. Share your location with your friends if you're going on dates. We can't be, we have to protect each other. We protect ourselves and protect each other. And, and the truth is there is... Um, of course, a lot of amazing people out there, but there's also obviously a lot of the other. So we just have to do our due diligence. Absolutely. Yeah. Christy Oxborough, fantastic work as always. 12 out of 10. I'm very proud of you now and always. Look, I I don't know if I'll ever surpass his affinity for fruit. <laughs> <laughs> his affinity for fruit would be his undoing. It was just, it sounds like it should be spoken in iambic pentameter. Like, it's just so yeah. good. Yeah. I think slowly I'm, like, somehow writing a novel over every episode, but just I one so. line per episode. <laughs> <laughs> you just have yeah. to weasel it out. Like, you have to really look for it. But somewhere in there, somewhere in there is that novel. Oh, yeah. There's a novel, a code, all of the above. Look. A cipher. If I would, oh, you know, I'd love that. Um, if I ever write a book, and I, I'm going to say when I write a book because I would love to. So I'm going to say when instead of if to like manifest. Um, when I write a book, I will do my damnedest to put in the line his affinity for fruit. Or maybe that's just what I'll call it, affinity for fruit. And then I have to work around it. Oh my God, there's my, uh, there's the name of my book. Oh, yep. of my own personal book an affinity for fruit although i'll have to put juice and then we can talk about my obsession with peach juice that was terribly and has gone awry and has been replaced by a love of pineapple juice although specifically it's not straight it's called pineapple breeze <laughs> <laughs> the breeze is of the islands yeah 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 i like it beautiful that's what it is well listen um we thank you so much for your work we thank you, dear listeners, for joining us on this romp. Um, if you haven't already, give us a follow on the socials on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube at True Crime and Cocktails, on Twitter at Not Detectives. If you'd like some bonus content, go over to patreon.com slash True Crime and Cocktails for more about our subscription-based service over there. And of course, the only place for official True Crime and Cocktails merch is truecrewmerch.com, so check that out as well if you're interested. Christy, do you want to tell the people about next week's episode? Um, yeah, but also there's not one. Next week, we're dark. Next week, we are. we're dark, but we are. we are back March 5th. Yes, that is correct. And on March 5th's episode of True Crime and Cocktails, The Keepers, part one. That's right. We got a very special two-part episode of, on the hit documentary, The Keepers, um, so, uh, I know that, listen, this is a story that confounded me and I know it's confounded many. So, uh, it's so much info. It's gotta be two, two parts and I cannot wait yeah. for that. Yeah. I'm excited. Listen, um, Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Good night, Captain Sean Couturier. <laughs> goodnight, Garrett Dillahunt.